What is going on, everybody? I'm Tom. And I'm Pat. We're best friends, and you're listening to the Reminiscent Podcast. They say you can't choose your family. Well, you also can't choose which era of music you grew up in. This is a weekly show where we discuss our favorite bands from adolescence and how they continue to shape our lives today. Each week, we'll head back to the early 2000s and take a closer look at the cards we were dealt. Tom, today we're talking about your favorite band. Indeed. One of my favorite songs from my all-time favorite band. Specifically the music video. We've had a couple requests... We've reached out to some fans. I think we're going to be. I think we're going to be diving back into the music video realm for a little while. And uh, this week, the week that Blink One Eighty Two releases their album Nine uh, <laughs> today, the day this podcast will be released, uh, we're going to go back and revisit a music video that is fifteen years old. Uh, I miss you off of the self-titled Blink One Eighty Two album, which was released in late two thousand three, I believe. But the video, I believe, if Wikipedia, which has not led us astray on this podcast in the past. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 15 years ago, we uh, Sad Tom was born. Wikipedia has only led us astray every time we do the year <laughs> drafts, and it gives me the wrong year every I single know. time. <laughs> There's like the Apple info and the Google info, and every time we've done an anniversary, I think we've only got a third of them correct, <laughs> but which we're, we're trying to triple source our release dates. But um, yeah, we haven't listened to all of nine, obviously. Maybe we'll do a review next week, probably not. But we'll see. It doesn't, not looking good. Things aren't looking good. So we're going to throw it back <laughs> to when things were a little simpler. Although probably the time when things took a turn for the worse for, for the group. Um, it was moody. And it wasn't all on Tom. I think there's a tweet that we might put in the show notes where a lot of the lyrics were of Mark's doing. So maybe it was just a moody time. Would you remember when you first heard the song? Okay, so I don't remember the... Mm. The first memory that I have of this song, it wasn't the first time I heard it. I don't remember the first time I heard it, but I remember I was in theater. I believe this would have been between seventh and eighth grade. And in between the weekend shows, we'd have like a morning show and then a night one. We'd beg one of our parents to drive us to the mall because we were little mall rats. And I was hanging out with... Sam Droney and Liz Venuto, who I was like head over heels in love with at the time. And for the subsequent like five years after that, she's just been like one of my best friends for a long time. Uh, we as soon as we walked into the Mill Creek Mall, this song came on. And I remember there was a bench like first thing we all just sat down on the bench and in total silence. Just listened to the song like. In the middle of the mall, <laughs> just, you know, just super like 2004 emo mall rats. Did you know it was blank? And like, had you been familiar with Enema? I had known all the small things at this point. I listened to, yeah, I'd been listening to Enema of the State kind of casually at this point. But I think I Miss You was the first thing that really like, launched blink 182 into my like full-time conscious and then that is when i really dove into enema of the state and dude ranch and take off your pants and jacket like this song actually like again blink 182 when i was like 11 all the small things is what made me want to become a musician but they weren't like top of my list i didn't really understand them as like a band other than just like the one song that came on the radio you know what i mean Right. Yeah. So for me, it was, there was like two distinctly embarrassing moments. One was when The Young and the Hopeless came out and I was talking, I think it was Andy Huck, or I don't know if we'd say the full name or whatever, but he was the always wore Dookie title album artwork t-shirts and stuff, just like fundamentally allowed to do more than I was. Like (laughs) he knew, he knew all the Simpsons episodes and you know, he's just like cooler and his parents were a little more lax with the pop culture. But like, yeah, th- I'm so, I can't wait for Good Charlotte's second album. He's like, actually, this is their second album. I'm like, son of a bitch. But <laughs> then there was like, because I figured like in my little fifth grade head or whatever, like, oh, this is the only, if I don't know about it, like, this is what 
Like I figured my understanding of the music industry and people's discographies was complete, like fully, like, and I believe that wholeheartedly. So this song came on the radio. We were driving home from some practice or something. And a girl who was in our grade, who just happened to live near me, but was getting a ride, kind of like a carpool. She's like, hey, I think this is Blink-182 on the radio. I'm like, <laughs> I think I'd know if this was Blink-182 on the radio. <laughs> And the more I heard Tom's voice, the more I knew I was wrong. And I like couldn't have been more of like the most pretentious little junior high idiot. Just like, yeah, I doubt that. I highly doubt that. And so I ran home and of course she was right. And uh, I don't know if I even ever apologize, which is wrong of me. But of course my brain was occupied then by getting my hands on the self-titled album and uh, digging in uh, and then learning that, oh, wow. Turns out there's been a lot of music released that I don't know about. So uh, definitely <laughs> right. something I remember as being deeply embarrassing, but like, oh my God, there's still a band. They're still coming out with music. There's so much to learn. There's so much to do. There's so little time. But yeah, and then, it was... like the next week they broke up. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, they're, yeah, they're still together. Wahoo. And then it's like, this was, and then it ended very fast. It's like, ah, oh, son of a bitch. But I distinctly remember that and being like, wow, hey, this is a band. Cool. And then the music video dropped, not not too not too f- far after that moment, and it was moody. It was dark. It was goth. My wife said, "Quote: You can use this for the pod, but it's as if the executives at Hot Topic made a music video," <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was like a really good take. Um, she hates the lyric. We can live like Jack and Sally. She thinks it cheapens it because of how much Nightmare Before Christmas stuff was sold at Hot Topic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was the straight hair, skinny jean, sad Tom era of Blink slash music in. We did uh, American Idiot last week, the 15 year anniversary. And uh, there was some straight dark hair, dark eyelids, uh, uh, eye makeup. You know, it was moody. It was, things were getting Things were getting moody. Yeah, man. Uh, I actually have a fun fact about the Jack and Sally line, but let me do the fun facts just in general because I actually think this song is. Yeah, because we're going to get into the music video a little deeply about it's an interesting little world they create, but let's do the fun facts first before we get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, so real quick, the music video was released February 2nd of 2004. And you mentioned Tom was getting moodier based on the lyrics, but I didn't know this but during the self-titled album mark and tom had this routine of discussing the theme of a song and then like locking themselves in different areas in writing their own parts without knowing what the other person was writing so on they did that on feeling this and in i miss you they each wrote their own part not knowing anything about the others so like mark's lyrics are a hundred percent mark tom apparently claims that mark is better at lyrics than him which i think is interesting because you've definitely seen the decline of blink 182's lyrics since tom left and how relatively good angels and airways lyrics are but anyway mark helped him with like some phrasing but they didn't know anything until they kind of like recorded the song and put it together so i thought that was really interesting because you wouldn't really expect that with how well it all flows together right especially when you look at the first few frames of the video you're like and what happened later with the types of the guitars tom's switched to yeah. playing and stuff like yeah. like this must be tom driving a nail through the middle of the band but really based on that mark tweet and everything he was i mean they were all it was all a different mood right than right. getting drunk and flip getting boners at water parks and flipping middle <laughs> fingers at people and stuff right <laughs> There's also not a single electric instrument recorded on this song. It's all like everything is acoustic and they claim there's like between 70 and 80 just instrument tracks, which isn't, I mean, that's kind of a lot, but I guess I never realized that like, oh, it is a double bass that, I mean, Mark didn't record with. I don't think he recorded that part, but I I just thought that was interesting. They've never done that before, like a fully acoustic full band thing anyway and apparently the chain smoker song closer which you have definitely made fun of in the past for like referencing that blink 182 song apparently they're referring (laughs) to i miss you like that's the blink 182 Mm. song interesting yeah i do i'm not a huge fan of that (laughs) tune sure i have i can't say i was covering bunbury in cincinnati 
couple years ago and happened to see them live. A lot of smoke, a lot of energy. Not for me. <laughs> that's okay. But that's an interesting tidbit. I would say of the fun facts, that's pretty fun. It, like it is one. pretty fun. Because they don't really give you a lot of clues. Yeah. I got two quick ones. There's like a short two minute behind the scenes video for this. Doesn't really cover much. But it was kind of fun to watch and see it was just some house in Hollywood Hills that was born in the late teens. It wasn't really a haunted mansion or anything. It was just someone's house. And the last thing is the Jack and Sally quote. Apparently, Travis Barker approached Mark asking if he can add that line in because he was a big fan of... Nightmare Before Christmas and his he and his wife Travis and his wife got married on October 30th and they had a Nightmare Before Christmas themed wedding. So that was kind of like a nod to Travis and his wife. Oh, that's nice. But what's really funny is like in my head I just imagine Travis coming up to Mark in their like little studio recording space and just being like Hey Mark, uh I know I'm just the drummer in this band, but uh, could you <laughs> could you just like say something about Jack and Sally and Mark being like, oh, yeah, buddy, right. for sure. Just like smack in the shoulders like, thanks, man. <laughs> just like super quiet. Walk away. <laughs> I just picture him coming in just kind of like not even using words to relay that inform information. <laughs> just kind of like and Mark treating it like a Lassie the dog situation. Like, what is it, boy? What is it, Travis? <laughs> oh, you want some new lyrics in the song? Come on, I need I need some more information. You know, just like him, just kind of brooding and looking at his feet, like Jack and Sally like, in the well. Okay. He just ha hands him a crumpled piece of paper from his back pocket or something. Yeah, Jack and Sally. Okay. Oh, he hands anyway. him. He hands him a crumpled up piece of paper. Just yeah. says, "Can you sing Jack and Sally?" Yeah. Like, oh, sure, man, sure. <laughs> but he's such a interesting guy. I, he was on some podcast recently that I was listening to. I guess he's really into vegan food or something. Anyway, he's it's interesting to hear him talk when he does talk, but he definitely had that kind of mysterious, is he mute? Although he referenced in that one pod a lot about how he kind of envies people who have taken vows of silence and stuff. So maybe he's kind of inspired by all that, but kind of, he's an interesting cat, obviously. I remember an episode of Punked where someone at a restaurant was like hitting on his wife and like kissing her arm and stuff. And Travis is just like, hey man stop <laughs> you know <laughs> like that, he seems like a pacifist he really does that was like him at like a full 10 pissed off you know stop <laughs> right <laughs> right right oh god anyways we can uh we can dive into the video i just thought there were some i honestly thought that i would find more about this video because like to me this was like music video of the millennium right because it just it consumed my whole life <laughs> right well to me it was just like hey blink Instead of speeding it up, they're right. slowing it down for this hit. You know, I remember that Entertainment Tonight feature, like, the bad boys of Blink-182 are slowing it down on your latest hit, I Miss You, from self-titled. You know, like, it was kind of shocking that they were not going to try to rock harder than, you know, First Date or something like that, which would have been their most recent hit before that or something. But um, I do remember that supposedly being kind of shocking, I guess. And then my first question I had, so they open up, they're in that what props to the set designer if it was a regular house it definitely looks like a haunted decrepit mansion um they're just playing their instruments you said it was all acoustic tracks for the recording mark is holding a stand-up bass in the video fam kind of famously they all have suits black uh, nail polish things like that very goth theme right i don't think i'm stretching or misinterpreting the term goth there but uh do you my question was and do you think he actually learned stand-up bass to make the video look good or was he just twirl on that son of a b around <laughs> well i i would have guessed that he would at least have vaguely learned the fingering charts because a, a double bass or a stand-up bass doesn't have frets so there is an unlimited amount of notes you can play whereas on a bass you have like three inches and it'll give you the right note so i figured he would at least kind of know where he was supposed to go but in this behind the scenes video, he claims that he had to put super glue on his fingers because his fingers were bleeding because he had never played a stand up bass before. Well, he's not shy in the Mark Thomas Travis show about like admitting he was not a classically trained bassist <laughs> by any means. But if <laughs> but if you say he, I mean, I don't know who would have laid down that 
track then if it would have been him for the actual recording or not. I guess it wouldn't matter one way or another, but it looked neat. But that was my first thought before I saw your note about, you know, it actually being what was laid down later for the uh, production. Um, but it just crossed my mind because he spins, he tries to make it about as rock and roll as a stand up bass can be. You know, he definitely. It looks good. A, little, uh, a few. Yeah. He nails it. They look sharp. They clean up well. It was a nice little scene. But I got to ask. So like we did an episode about Stacy's mom and kind of the logistics of that young man's lawn care business came into question <laughs> um, as we were doing that episode, which ended up being a good one if you want to go go back and check it out and share and rate and subscribe and leave a review. Um, <laughs> but my, I think my first question was like, in this world they've created for us, I, where do we start? Some of the people listening to this music, they're like a house band in this mansion that is abandoned. And some of the people that aren't the band members are are just dead, man. <laughs> they're just <laughs> dead on campus. They're just in the house, in and around the grounds, not alive anymore. Are, is it their responsibility to report that type of thing? <laughs> I'm just curious what you think the, the, the power structure would be, or are they just the entertainment? Um, what, what's... I just need to know what you think about this whole world they've created. <sighs> Where do you start? Because <laughs> like, well, I'm not, like the the black nail polish is that like a dress code thing for whoever <laughs> hired them, or did they did Mark add that on later as something he felt would really bring out his character? Or you know, I wonder like, is it like? Their dad, we, dad's weird friend from work told them about this place that was, you know, like, yeah, I know your son plays bass, right? Yeah, they're looking for a uh, moody young man to go sit in his house for all day and play music to horny slash deceased women. <laughs> and or deceased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the worst, creepiest want ad ever or best want ad ever. Yeah, why are they there? Who are these women? Why are they making out the whole time? What happened with their makeup? Like, <laughs> um, it is a fascinating video, and it it reminds me of what I always say about the Taking Back Sunday lyrics, where you're like, you don't really know what he's saying, but you feel it, you get it, you know, <laughs> and that is the, ang the angst comes through. <laughs> And like, this is Taking Back Sunday lyrics in a visual form, I feel like. Ooh. It like, it looks like there's fingerprints on the camera lens. Everything is a little bit blurry. <laughs> like, just, just all around good stuff. I kind of picture the, in the movie, um, The Sound of Music, the, mu the movie version where she's singing We Are 16 Going on 17, and they're dancing romantically around the grounds, and then they get to the part of the house where there's the dead women and this moody-looking band, and they just <laughs> dance in the other direction immediately. <laughs> like, no, we, we don't go on that part of the estate. Like, that's, sorry, we've come, we don't belong here. This is not good, so. So, is the band also dead? Are they ghosts? That's an interesting question, because... If they're all dead and this is some type of like middle ground before you reach it, what do they call it, purgatory? Yeah, yeah. Um, What's a Catholic thing? Are, would there be somebody who, can you die in purgatory? Like, oh yeah, they didn't make it. They didn't go in either direction. They just, because uh, <laughs> there is somebody, like, I think this place has a moat, we're led to believe, and there's somebody floating in it, right? You're not taking a nap <laughs> when you're face down in the moat. Like that's, Shit. so I don't know. I guess you can die in purgatory if that's is the the director's interpretation of what's going on here. Yeah, I I do like the thought of like just they're a house band entertaining ghosts. And There you go. I mean that that's I guess your take, but like yeah, how who does like who covers payroll in that situation? Do the ghosts pay? <laughs> right. Is it U.S. dollars? Ghost cash? Poltergeist pennies? Ghost green? Phantom finance? Ghoul gold? Revenant revenue? Spear scratch? And where do the women come from? <laughs> where do women come from? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that's, hey, men come from Jupiter because they're more stupider, but I guess women would come from elsewhere. Um, no, yeah, the women in the in the mansion in this, uh, in this particular video is, is more of what I meant, I suppose. Yeah, I think... I like the theory. So you, so you think they're all dead? I like the theory that it's purgatory and that they are like elevator music 
because in Catholic, oh, what's it called? Doctrine or whatever. You go to purgatory when you weren't good enough to go to heaven. And then your friends and family have to pray you out of purgatory, <laughs> which is better than the old days where you had to pay your way out of purgatory. You had to pay the church for like, get out of purgatory passes. So I think maybe they're all dead, but I, I do think it seems like the band was hired to be there. Cause like, what they just have a full drum set in purgatory that Travis happened to find and they happened to play. Like, I think they were put there for entertainment. Well, here's purposes. the thing though. There are giant spiders everywhere <laughs> in this house. So they must've blown all their budget on the entertainment because the pest control is, I think to use the word control, it's non existent. There's live things crawling. Um, in every room, in every room, and they're well documented on camera throughout the music video. There's so many that they just bump into each other and start fighting. Like there's just many more spiders than you would hope to ever see, uh, unless it's your kind of party. It, it, you know, it's it's an interesting. Uh, ain't no party like a spider party. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I was really looking forward to you finishing that once you dove into it. <laughs> I was I was struggling to think of a species of spider that starts with the P, but then I realized I don't know any species of spider. Yeah, like, <laughs> hmm, I've started this sentence, but I have not studied this uh, line of biology at all. Uh, <laughs> Daddy long leg party. It would be about all I could get. Whoa, that sounds like a fucking party. <laughs> right. I do love, I think a thousand people have made that Twitter joke, but um, scientists, when naming those types of spiders were like, what about long legs? And like, no, it's not kinky enough. Like, <laughs> um, so it's kind of an overused joke at this point, but it still makes me laugh when I see it. Um, oh God. But yeah. So, I mean, throughout the video, Birth of Moody Tom, they're all kind of moody. I'm not sure Mark is even playing the instrument and <laughs> Travis is doing his thing. What were your reactions to seeing it the first time? Um... The first time I was like, okay, this is art. I, <laughs> like most art, I don't quite get it, but I like that they're doing it. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's nice, right? It totally fits the vibe and the mood of the song, the lyrics. I think it. I think it's a great video. It doesn't have to make sense. It was again, if we look back at the rock show, where they're literally just throwing money at homeless people, <laughs> like. They've come a long way. That was a in, tricky one, yeah. And they're like, oh, how punk. And then they're just like whipping cash at people like, ow, like this is too close range. <laughs> Stop throwing things. Like, yeah. Oh, you darn punkers. I I really like it. You know, it's been a few years since I watched the video and I watched it, you know, maybe seven or eight times before we recorded to write down some thoughts. And it's nice, man. You know, it's it gets weird and sexual, like you know, we talk about the teenagers making out through the the jail cells or the viewing glass or whatever. They seem to like the concept Is that the of feeling this making one? out in strange places. That's from feeling this. Yeah. Um, well, we were thinking about like someone trying to describe like if, the, for the, if they did work for a house band and they were at a party later that night or something like, oh, yeah, what are the what are the women doing? It's like uh, some of them are dead and the ones that are alive are making out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure who here is enjoying the music per se, but that is what <laughs> they tend to do. Um, yeah, that's a really funny article or bit that you wrote that is on our website right now. I That's probably one of my favorite things you've ever written for the site. <laughs> it was interesting to think about. I mean, we've written a, a few things for some of the past few pods that you can go check those out. I think it's reminiscentpodcast.com slash notes. I actually don't. It? I changed it recently. I don't think it's slash blog. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I think it's slash notes. I'll, I'll put a link in the in the show notes at reminiscentpodcast.com slash episode slash 137 to check out this uh, conversation between Mark of the house band and uh, <laughs> some someone else. It's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you liked it. 
because mostly this whole doing this whole show is to make you giggle. So right. um, <laughs> I'm glad that was accomplished. Here's my thing. We covered American Idiot, which we talked a little bit about last week when that album came out that next Halloween. We saw some of our classmates who were pretty preppy coming to school with all black with the tie and the straightened hair and the eye makeup. And then this comes out and Tom is very pale and it's very black and white with the you know nail, nail polish on the base and everything like that. And just when you think it couldn't get any paler, like a year later, Gerard Way is like, hold my beer. I'm going to almost look <laughs> translucent and I'm not okay. I promise music video. So I don't know which started. It's kind of like the Conan O'Brien, Jim Gaffigan, Pale, Pale Force thing, but in weird pop punk music, moody right. emo <laughs> shit. But by the time I'm not okay, I promise came around with Gerard Way possibly dying during the filming of in his garage of uh, of the that music video just he does not look well probably on purpose of course it's on purpose but um the purple eyes was a bold choice uh, of makeup <laughs> choice for sure but at this point i think it's ushered in the era i mean at this point we're fully in the moody emo revival i don't even know if revival was the right word but things had taken a turn like we talk like again we don't talk every week about how this show tries to break down the decade and what went weird, right? At this point, things are established as different. Right around the time this I Miss You music video dropped, and then a year later, I'm, I'm Not Okay, I Promise dropped, and you were seeing more bands like My Chemical Romance with names like My Chemical Romance, and right. you know, the word Harlequin was being used a lot by a lot of people, <laughs> including Panic at the Disco, just weird Victorian shit like that. Um, did you feel that at the time? Do you see it now? Am I way off? I don't know. I mean, it, it definitely seemed like looking back, I wasn't aware at the time, but it seems to be like the mainstreamification of emo. Like, I mean, you had bright eyes, you know, around this time doing stuff. And that was about as emo as it gets, but it seems like it was becoming more of a visual thing. I definitely remember more guys wearing black eyeliner at that time kind of being into it because I wanted to be goth. Uh, my mom wouldn't let me, so I settled for emo. <laughs> and... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think everybody has one of those stories, but like, hey, mom, this is my look now. It's not. Cool. Yeah, no, just checking in first before, I'm, you know, <laughs> just like I would, you know, of course, everybody has, you know, a similar situation, but I can only because I know your mom pretty well right like i can just picture that interaction like tom let's go back to your room you know just like, <laughs> laying laying the law down like you know what cool you know i was it was pretty punk of me to try though right um <laughs> and <laughs> but here's my question you i mean we're also seeing bands like dashboard confessional and things like that well i take it all back i don't want to dive into this because i haven't researched the birth of emo or anything but at this point emo is a term that's being used a lot you're starting to see south park episodes where there's goth kids saying conformist, you know, stuff like that. Like it's kind of a, not subculture, but I guess lunchroom table of black t-shirts that are getting made fun of at this point, smoking cigarettes across the street at the 7 Eleven. You know, there's kind of like, not that that didn't exist before, but it was very front row, very mainstream. Is that fair to say? Like it was not that it was invented around this time, but it was definitely kind of the, the focus shifted back to that look and that way of thinking and this weird sadness the glorifying sadness i'm you step in here because I'm, I'm floundering a little bit but yeah no 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 um, i mean again i think I it think was it everywhere just, it was everywhere it just it peaked out from the subculture just into mainstream culture a bit and but still i mean this genre of music is pretty niche i mean 2004 there was a lot of like big hip hop and like club music coming out in that time, which probably absolutely like dominated the actual mainstream. But I guess like in our slightly smaller subculture, the even smaller emo subculture bled into, but I still think Chingy was like big at this time. Right. So like, right. Well, we've always wanted to do an episode on, yeah, exclamation point with Lil John and Usher and all them. And cause it was like, obviously you couldn't escape that song and country grammar, stuff like that. Like there's yes. definitely, Oh. one song episodes that we might have guests on to do later once we figure out how to do, give them justice because they were 
huge. Like, and you, it's hard to ignore. I mean, people talk about the strokes too much. Like, you got to give little John needs an episode or two just to kind of dig back through what all that was and how big it was and how every sketch show on the planet made fun of it at the time. Um, the way, the things he said that were recorded, but the three words or whatever. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, for this pod specifically, the emo pop punk stuff like that, it was taken over, but there was a very different, there was like two strains. There was the dashboard confessional strain and there was the, I mean, there were two bands called matchbook romance and my chemical romance. Like there was the word (laughs) romance and maybe 33% of the band's names for sure, (laughs) which was a huge uptick. If you look at the Google search trends, I'm sure it'll reflect that. Just kidding. But, um, (laughs) there was definitely the moody, dark, not pseudo metal, but like, I don't know. Then you started to bleed into bands like Thursday and some of the like taking back harder than taking back Sunday bands that were just kind of yelling more and like who can out moody each other. And you know, we're not even going to say words, man. We're just going to yell. It got nasty. It got, it got ugly. It got, uh, got feisty. I don't know. (laughs) You want to talk about feist for a second too? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not only feisty. (laughs) Although no, she's, uh, we honestly, I would talk about the song Musha Boom and its impact for years. (laughs) I just want to talk about things. I just want to t- discuss movies and music that reflect Michigan things. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Mushy Boom. I'm going to talk about the movie, Jeff Daniels movie, Escanaba in the Moonlight. Um, there's just a lot of Michigan related pop culture that needs its day in the sun, but perhaps today is not that day. Sure. Grand Torino as well. Can't forget. <laughs> yeah, man. Similar to the Little John episode, our Michigan pop culture episode is coming soon, I swear. <laughs> so I think... Also, in terms of Moody Tom, we also started to hear Tom singing his vowels a little weirder or more stylized, if you want to give Which it some credit. he's been joking about on Twitter a lot lately. Like he he's has. really um, owning it. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, he tweeted. Let me pull it up. It was so funny. He just tweeted, like, where are you with, like, eight U's? And it made me laugh so hard. And, again, we keep doing, like, planning episodes. Like, we'll plan something, and then a day later, something big happens about that topic, but we're not ready to release it for another, like, week and a half. Um, so yeah, he, do you want to run through real quick the Blink-related news that we've been kind of skimming over since the summer? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. But also someone, uh, and while you kind of gather your thoughts, I'll describe it. one of the other tweets he sent where somebody was asking him, you know, when did his singing style change and, you know, whether they want to hear him as this or that in their own head sometimes. And he's like, he just, you know, very self-aware tweeted something like, you know, whatever comes to your yed at the time. And he even spelled it. You know? <laughs> um, so I, in two or three recently, he's really been addressing it. And um I don't know. There's been some tweets that hinted at, not that they're not at a reunion directly, but um, the the tone seems friendlier than it has in the past. Uh, well, I'm stealing your thunder, but there's a couple new records coming out. There's a lot happening. But for Angels and Airwaves as well, so it, it, maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree here. Well, I just bought tickets to see Angels and Airwaves next Tuesday. I'm in Denver. I'm super excited about it. And just in terms of talking about Tom still... Did you hear that the Navy uh, confirms that UFO footage posted by Tom DeLonge are real and should not have been released? <laughs> like yeah. He- <laughs> What's interesting about the 2016 election cycle is there's been a few Washington Post and New York Times headlines hinting that these pilot accounts that are kind of – there's a book that his com- DeLonge's company put out um, to the Stars Academy – the book's called uh, Secret Machines. Um, I read like the first half of it and then gave it to you. Um, but it kind of highlights, you know, in a fictional way what this real life situations might have looked like that would have led up to these sorts of things. Um, that this kind of high tech flight technology is out there and the government is, you know, hiding it, blah, blah, blah. Or plans to use it, but doesn't know how or when it would be needed. But it's like this very advanced, you know, turning. And I don't know flight terms, so I'm not going to try to say them now. But um his he's getting a history channel show it's weird that that stuff is picking up so much or has been talked about i don't know if it's working or being profitable or if he's even having a good time doing that but it's interesting that the angels and airwave stuff is ramping up as well i think when blink announced their album he posted about the history channel show or some piece of alien where it seems kind of in step with what blink is doing which makes me think maybe wrongly 
that he's paying a hell of a lot of attention to Blink and what they're doing and that a reunion is, in the next 10 years is inevitable. Uh, just there's so much more going mm. on. It's kind of like, you know, they always say that, he, he and Mark always say that there's no bad blood. It's just, you know, you grow up, blah, blah, blah. But right. I don't know. I think there's, I, I don't know. Do you feel, are you picking up the same vibes or am I way off on this? Um, I mean, Tom has definitely tweeted out stuff like, you know, I'll come back at some point. I just don't know when. I do think, though, that as a founding member of Blink-182, anything Blink does without him, I have to imagine he still makes profit on because he's probably a co- yeah, I mean, he was quoted as saying, name. yes, keep is doing my job for me at one point. I think he was quoted as saying that. <laughs> but like, I mean, he he still probably owns the name Blink-182. He's making money off all the new stuff. So it's in his best interest to just double down on himself. With good Blink news, people will think of Tom. So it's a good time to like post his own stuff because anytime Blink does anything without Tom, they'll think what's Tom doing is what I would imagine anyway. And yeah, it's it's just in his best interest for both things to do well. Was I Miss You their best music video? <sighs> I love First Date. I really, really do. That's right. And we dressed Is up it in their top three Halloween. or top five. We did. Yeah. I would kind of want to mail them Polaroids of that and just be like, just give us a thumbs up and say hello. Just acknowledge it for a quick second. It was a very good Halloween costume. It feels I, weird to be doing a show about a band that you like so much because it feels like, you know, almost not right or something. But that was a really fun video. This one, it's almost like it's dramatic and moody and hot topic, but also unremarkable in a lot of ways. Am I allowed to say that? I think that's fair. Yeah. It, not that they phoned it in, but it's calm. It, there's a look to it, but there's not a feel to it, kind of. It's just like some creepy stuff. It kind of reminds me of the make damn sure music video where taking back sunday is just in like this a box <laughs> and they show footage of leopards hunting other creatures and it's like a national geographic special but also like if the, you were flipping back and forth between nat geo and fuse that day and just kind of like made your own music video by flipping the tv back and forth and somebody recorded it this reminds me of that but instead you're flipping back and forth from like 24 days of Halloween on ABC family or something. You just happen to see some creepy shit in the middle of them sitting in the middle of this house playing music. Um, <laughs> there wasn't a ton about it that would leave you. I don't know. Other than the song itself being a turning point for the band. It's only, I'm not going to say it's one of my favorites, I guess is what I'm, I'm landing on, but sure. it was, it was an interesting little goth experiment for them. I mean, the, the, the album itself was pretty different, very different than you very. know their two, their two mega hits, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what else to say other than I I love this song. Like, I went out and bought brushes for my drums as soon as I heard this track because I kind of heard what Travis was doing on the drums. I bought a cowbell because of that part in feeling this. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I... I just, I love this song, man. The video, I don't know, like videos can be whatever. It doesn't matter because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't take away from the song itself. And I just think the song is like so perfect. Tom's verse comes in. I mean, Mark does obviously the killer job, but the verse comes in and he, Tom just fucking slays it. And also what makes me love this song even more is there was a video I remember lime wiring. It was... Blink-182 live at Pepsi Smash or something, and they're playing Miss You, but it is like really loud, heavy electric guitars, heavy drums, and Tom's vocals are definitely overdubbed or there's some post done to it because he sounds like fucking perfect, but that video of like them, it sounds like they're covering their own song in their more thought of style it makes me love the song even more because then the song becomes this dynamic thing where like it can be this super layered melancholy acoustic song but it can also be like a really bombastic rock song and i've also heard people cover it in like the skank beats like really fast and i think that's just the sign of a a really really good song when it can be done many different ways and each of those versions doesn't take away from the other, but it's its own like very special, unique thing. And I just fucking love this song. 
Yeah, I think my final thought would be music video is kind of not forgettable, but unremarkable, but it's memorable for like kind of the look of it, but the contents maybe not, not spectacular, but so memorable, but for different, not as cool reasons as them running naked through, you know, the neighborhoods of, (laughs) right. You know, Palo Alto or over the in California, they're from San Diego. Um, but I will say that there was a time, like my first, before our first computer just broke and I lost all my music, my first iTunes library, my most played by far was Miss You and Island in the Sun by Weezer by like oh. a large margin. So oh, it was okay. at okay. one point, it, it's a hit. It's a good tune. And uh, yeah, it's nice to look back on a little bit. I do have something that I'd like to interject with, if you don't mind, as we kind of shift towards the second half of the episode. Yeah. Can I give a super, super crazy, exciting announcement first, though? Yeah, by all means. Okay. So I in probably early 2020 will be it sounds like it was just an idea that kind of turned real last week i'll be launching a new podcast and i'm currently emailing with tom delong's pr team about getting him on the podcast it could totally be a dead end they could just stop responding at any time but i it they were intrigued enough to email me back a couple times so which is pretty crazy it, which is super fucking crazy. <laughs> so, because you already um, have like four to five guests lined up of like friends you've made in the music industry and podcasting industry and things like that so far, right? Yeah, like big guests too. Like it's going to be a pretty cool show. Um, well, if you've seen or if you've been around, you probably or have listened to us. One of our most listened to episodes was Tom interviewing Sam Pura, who produced uh, which record again? The story so far is Proper Deuce. Right, 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 and that. Blew up, and this I think that's probably what planted the seed, right? Is you know enough interesting people in the industry that would, you know, be worth your time to sit down with some of these people, and maybe the guests would get bigger and bigger over time, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, I I kind of wanted it to just be like the sister show to this one, where that one's like could be like the big funnel where you get the famous people in, and I I'll I'll, I'll kind of talk about what it's about later because we're running long, but. I would love to then like filter that audience into this one if they want like more of like the same music, but like a different vibe of the show. So I'm hoping that the two will play together super nicely. We're going to continue doing this one, obviously, but I think it could be, they could be really cool counterparts to each other. Well, you're learning a little more about what you can and can't get away with as a, a small business owner as well. You work an X amount of hours a day, but you find yourself still having time for projects that you want to take on when you finish this video series you're doing right the tutorial series once that's done um you'll have time to do more cool stuff right i mean you're it's cool as a friend to learn that you've are just getting better and better by the week uh, uh at running this business you've created well thanks man um yeah it, it's just as I edit more podcasts for other people i'm realizing how badly i want to be the creator so the videos have been fun, but I I just want to do more podcasts. And yeah, I just thought like I, I know people in the industry that would get attention to the show. And I could use the friends that I have who are already pretty big names to just keep getting bigger names. And are you relaunching your network? Is that what I'm hearing? Kind of. Yeah. And, you know, I have friends. I'm like half joking, but legitimately, <laughs> you know, you're... It'd be multiple shows coming out of your umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I I have friends signed to a bunch of different record labels. They know their PR person can get me in touch with, you know, band, other bands on the label and all that kind of stuff. So I just think it could be really fun. It's going to be a lot of work, like super heavy research based. And I'm not a good interviewer. So I'm also terrified. But anyways, just wanted to throw that out there because it seems like there's a non-zero chance of me interviewing Tom DeLong in the future. So super exciting. Keep a, keep an That'd eye out. That'd be wild. Me. Yeah. 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 Not just, yeah, but hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay. So last week uh, we were talking about that dynamic when you're at a meeting at work and an older person or somebody, maybe they come out with a new album or make the news for some reason, or maybe they pass and things like that. And certain producers and songwriters and bands and, you know, all the people seem to really enjoy maybe more boomers than Gen Xers, but whoa, you've never heard of X, Y, or Z. 
Right. And when I was riffing last week, I mentioned Rush, which is a pretty bad example of what I was trying to get my point across as, because uh, they rock and are great. Uh, so they were just a classic rock radio band that came to my head at the time. So I wanted to amend my statements as that's not what I meant to say and kind of move forward in a different direction that might take up two or three minutes of shows moving forward, if you don't mind. Sure. But the concept is this, like people younger than Gen X, 1985 and on maybe is kind of the generic, what we've been working with for Gen Y. What the question is kind of like, what exactly are we responsible for knowing? And then the question part B becomes, what can we start to eliminate being responsible for, right? So there's like Thriller and The Chronic and Nevermind and Rumors and some of the like the best selling albums of all time that you should at least be no, you should at least know Michael Jackson and Fleetwood Mac, you know what I mean? And the Beach Boys, Pet Sounds, things like that. Like just kind of, there's a top, you could pull up any top 40, top 50 list that I'm sure all the music magazines have them. But kind of on the other end, I came up with three questions basically this week that I might have more questions in the future, but I want to kind of set up this segment as saying like, can we start to trim? Cause it's just so much music to be, you know what I mean? So question one, and I mean this seriously, how many Bob Dylan records do we need to be familiar with? And I'm not taking away from Bob Dylan at all. There's a lot. I'm just looking to strike a deal. We're in the Vegas pawn shop. I'm going to go get my guy. We're going to talk this out. What's the proper value? <laughs> Blood on the tracks. Can I get away with just no one? Like, do I need to know three Bob Dylan albums? Obviously, he's an icon. But let's just work this. Let's work something out. It's a lot of hours of music we're listening to at that point because he was obviously very productive. Point two, question two of three. Do we need to be intimately familiar with the Grateful Dead or is a loose understanding of the birth of LSD and its recreational use enough? Are we allowed to just listen to trucking and kind of know what their early days and what that scene was like? Very druggy. Um, is it more important to know the what the story of LSD is, or is it more important to know deep cuts of Grateful Dead? You know, in terms of American history, what's going to benefit us? I think that's a legitimate conversation we had. Question number three. I'm just looking for a ruling on Jim Morrison of The Doors. Is he at the level of Prince or Bowie? And if not, I'm not saying whether he is or isn't, can we at least start placing these acts on different tiers in terms of importance if we're in that meeting and you're like, you never heard LA woman? It's like, okay, easy. All right. I, in my head, my dad used to sing Mojo Rise and while making pancakes or whatever, Mr. Mojo Rise. And I think he told me it was an anagram or some crap, but is it an anagram when you rearrange the letters? I think so. That's not the point, I guess. Let me continue. What I'm saying is, do we have to care about Jim Morrison? Maybe, probably, maybe, probably not. I've heard people in both camps, if the older folks can just get together, maybe hand us a Prince record or a Bowie record instead and say, you know what, maybe if you know, know the three most famous tracks off of The Doors, LA Woman, you're going to be fine. Just know that Jim Morrison had a deep voice and was kind of a polarizing figure of sorts, but maybe he's tier B. And if he's not, I'd like to know, but we, maybe just kind of point us in the proper directions. We're just looking to avoid those office uh, squabbles. And that's really all I'm trying to accomplish with this particular segment. Hopefully we'll have more helpful questions and answers as we move forward. Tweet us at underscore reminiscent FM if you have opinions on this, questions you want answered as well, mostly because I wanted to apologize to the Canadian trio Rush for my misriff last week on this very topic. Anyway, thanks for letting me have the floor, Tom. Well, I'll tell you, I could not name one single song from any of those artists that you just named. The Doors, Rush, Jim Morrison. I don't even think Prince. Purple Rain, maybe? So Morrison fronted The Doors. My question is, I do think we should be responsible just to help understand our older brethren. You know, the, I feel like you have like a societal, like, like Anthony Bourdain wrote in one of his books, you have a societal like duty to be able to make your guest an omelet if they're at your house, right? Like you need to know certain basic cooking shit. Are there basic, what are the basic fundamental like citizen of the world albums? And, you know, like I get that we need to be familiar to a certain degree with some of these legends, but to be ribbed for, you know, I don't know, Grateful Dead. Do we really have to go through a Grateful Dead phase? You know, like Marin likes to joke about like, I'm too old to get into fish. There's just a lot of shit out there. You know what I mean? So <laughs> where I'm just looking to start a dialogue is basically where we're at. Well, let me just say that this reminds me a lot of when Tool knocked Taylor Swift's album off the number one spot. Everyone was making fun of Taylor Swift fans for never having heard of Tool before. And it's like they haven't released an album in 13 years. Right. You can't Why? hold it against them. But 
So I didn't hear about Tool till I got to college, and it was a person who lived across the hall from me, his favorite band. And then you see, it's kind of like I was referencing embarrassing stories at the beginning of this pod. I heard Float On by Modest Mouse for the first time, and then I looked at what I could download on the iTunes library, and there was like six albums. I'm like, there's six f***ing Modest Mouse. You know, like, oh, my God. So it's just like, oh, Tool, they sound like a fun, interesting band. You know, like there's like another, that amount of work of just something you're totally unaware of. Uh, but I feel like you should know or be familiar with what Tool is or was or does or did, perhaps. And if not, I don't think you can blame the young Taylor Swift fans for not having heard of them because they haven't been super active, right? I mean, obviously, you couldn't really hold that against, a, what, like a 13-year-old, right? I mean, like, there are fans who haven't lived in a world where they've come out with stuff, right? So that's obviously an absurd... Right. I mean, imagine a world where Taylor Swift fans have a median age of 20, that means Tool's last album came out when they were seven. Think of your seven-year-old self being aware of any fucking album just dropping, let alone a Tool album. You know, like, of course they're not going to know. It's like people are getting rid of analog clocks in a school. What does society come to? It's like, do you know how to read a fucking sundial? Fuck yourself. It is not <laughs> relevant anymore. You know? Can you navigate by the stars get the fuck out of here <laughs> who cares <laughs> who cares like who cares? those things <laughs> anyways i'm getting all i'm getting all angry we no get it's out. easy to get hot and bothered about the point of the segment was to say can we just start the dialogue and if we can get a ruling on let's throw a tool in there for next week we'll come up with a better we'll research tool a little bit and come up with the appropriate question like you know is it enough to be familiar with bob seeger and the silver bullet band's greatest hits or do we have to have at least have an album that we prefer of all of them, um, depending on what CD was in our car when we drove a long distance or something and needed CDs you hadn't listened to before? Just looking for a ruling, and we can move on, but uh, it always gets our blood boiling when there's kind of this level of judgment between generations. I think if we don't try to ease that with this show, I think maybe we're not, I don't want to stoke the fire with this show, but perhaps maybe gain a better understanding. That's all. Sure. That's okay. all. Obviously... Okay. We were too young to be blasting Nirvana's Nevermind in the womb, right? I doubt, you know how they have the baby Shakespeare stuff, they put the headphones over the stomach. My mom was not putting Polly into my ears at that while I was uh, <laughs> prenatal. Uh, it'd be a little disturbing to play that for your baby. So yeah, we just missed the boat, but we'd love to learn. And that's all I'm saying. Okay, so we're running a little long. Maybe we can do the summer recap later but i did kind of want to talk about you were going to put a playlist together we have a couple songs of the week kind of what we were watching reading and listening to this summer i think we wanted to get into more of that stuff uh let people know what we're up to or at least what we're consuming right yeah i mean we can definitely hit on the playlist stuff our friend listener of the show queen amanda said that she really enjoyed the playlist that we make so Every month, I'm going to... Which be... I think she is the higher power that the show reports to at this point. I think in terms of if we're adding like a rock mystic thing to it, like that would definitely be like, does she even exist? Who's to say? Maybe we've, we've been making it up on our own. It's like a goofy Tyler Durden thing. Like she's just this weird female rock alter ego that may or may not exist in the real world. Um, but <laughs> either way, uh, she she made put in a request for more... Uh, what we're consuming. Uh, so we might start to end the show with more than just songs, right? It'd be more yeah. specific about what we've been what we've been up to. Sure, sure. But we're also going to be making an Apple Music and a Spotify playlist every month that will consist of our songs of the week after every episode and just other stuff we've been listening to. So that's going to be coming out every month. You can follow us on Spotify and Apple Music. And those will be out and there will be a link in the show notes to that. So that'll be fun. And obviously, we're all consuming more stuff than that. So do you want to mention that? Yeah, I'll start. One of my songs on that playlist, and I've had a couple songs of the week that will be on there as well. Uh, the new Charlie XCX album dropped. Her single, Gone, had been out all summer. Um, I had joked a couple episodes ago about only enjoying music by people named, or groups or artists named Charlie over the summer. I think in the spring, if you listen to the show, you know I was really into the new Charlie Bliss record. Right, This right. new Charlie XCX record, Gone, it it bops. It bumps it's good it's a good pop song um i'm excited to dig a little more into the full album and then just more of the stuff i've been getting into i had pre-ordered the chuck glosserman latest book raised in captivity it was very interesting very unlike what he's done in the past more like short chapters more kind of like glimpses of short stories it was interesting and good i recommend it 
I was intrigued by the Hell Omega tour, but maybe we can talk about that at a later week. Um, I just had that listed here. Uh, the movie Plus One and the show Pen15 on oh, Hulu. Uh, so Maya Erskine good. is a hilarious person that deserves more screen time yes. wherever she can get it. Pen15 is hilarious. Plus One has Dennis Quaid's son as the male lead, and she plays like they are plus, make a deal to be Plus Ones at each other's weddings. And if you know me at all, you know that I unironically fucking love rom-coms and this was a solid one uh, not too predictable but it basically follows the tropes of your basic rom-com and it was her comedy throughout keeps it alive in a big way so yeah that's what uh that's what i've been up to lately nice yeah i my song of the week would be hate me sometimes by stand atlantic they just put it out a few days ago we got retweeted by the band and that kind of blew up and was fun there's quite a few new followers on our twitter that were having fun why don't you hit them with the with. handle again tom and while they're oh. breaking their phones while subscribing to this it show is. um they can also maybe follow us on twitter it's at underscore reminiscent fm we've been like way more active on that lately trying to have some fun with that so that's where we talk to people so yeah come hit us up I, i've there. been meaning to say nice tweet man oh thanks dude <laughs> um i am seeing stand atlantic october 9th trying to get an interview with their singer bonnie for the new podcast while they're in town that'd be awesome Find our pinned tweet and like it just so she get they get those yes. notifications to come on the show. Yes, or yes, not yes. the show, be Tom's first guest on his new interview pod. Yeah, something. I have been watching a lot of re-watching Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23 on Hulu. Ooh. It was a, a very short-lived sitcom. Uh, Dreama Walker is one of my three celebrity crushes. She is in the show along with James Vanderbeek playing a fictional version of himself. He was the he was Dawson in Dawson's Creek and it is so funny. Like it is so just carefree and funny. It's a very light show to just consume. There's like three seasons. He did this like talk show that Tig Notaro is doing recently. I think it's on Amazon, but she doesn't follow pop culture a lot, even though she's like a famous comedian and bumps elbows with these people every once in a while. She had to be in a room with James Vanderbeek and he was her first guest. And the talk show is that she doesn't know who, the, who this guy is at all and <laughs> has to figure out through like a line of questioning that he was in famous 90s show. And so like she starts to figure it out after a while, but she's like, they're trying to use Pictionary clues to guess what the name would be. She's like Vander Bird, you know, just kind of like Vander. B. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I think I've heard that before. And it's anyway. It's it's. He seems like a good sport. But is it Christina Ritter who plays the B in Apartment Twenty Three, or is that the wrong first name? R Ritter, something Ritter. Yeah. Right, right, right. She, her death in um, Breaking Bad. Oh, Sorry, spo spoiler alert, but it's been a, a while. But me up. Um, still makes me think that the actress has passed. Like that episode <laughs> hit me so hard and out of the blue because Jesse Pinkman's character arc is so tragic. Oh, but, um, God. Good to know that that's just my subconscious reacting to a Breaking Bad episode and not real. But it's good right. to hear that, that that show was good. Maybe it didn't get a fair shot. Yeah, they, they really need more. That show was... Dude, James Vanderbeek is hilarious. And uh, Dream of Walker caught those eyes. Um, love that girl. Anyways, and she's funny too. Super talented. I am trying to, I haven't read much in a while, which is sad. I have both the books Dune and The Maze Runner, which are like books I should have read 10 years ago. I'm trying to get on that. I've really been wanting to consume more earth based stuff. You read Artemis, right? You, yes. You gave that to me. I think we both read that like kind of in the spring. Yeah. Okay. You didn't like it, but I would argue Not that really. it's, you know, it's no Martian, but it's hard to write the Martian twice, right? right? Like, I yeah. thought it was good. Yeah, I just, I want to read more like Earth-based dystopian sci-fi, like future stuff. I don't know why like that subgenre is so fascinating to me, but Ready Player One just like f***ed up my world. I just, I wish I could read that book on repeat every day for the rest of my life, but... Yeah, that's that's it. I haven't done much reading this summer. I've actually I read Armada, Armada, which was the not the sequel, the second book from the guy that wrote Ready Player One. Again, it was okay. I think it had the same issues that Artemis did, just kind of a sophomore slump trying to, you know, catch lightning twice in the same jar with the whatever the f 
the saying is, but well, I think you're uh, you go yeah. into Artemis thinking it's going to be The Martian again, but it's really a crime thriller. But you don't realize that till two thirds of the way through. You're like, oh, right. this is a, a a crime novel that just happens to be on the new on on the moon. So yeah, but maybe that surprise is good. I I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed it. But okay, sorry, I, I think I'm cutting off your list. Also, here's my fun fact of the week: Eric Andre was in the show you're watching, The Bean Apartment Twenty Three. Yes, he's hilarious too. Jeez, what a good show. Yeah. Eric Andre, add him to the list of things we've been enjoying lately. Just maybe, maybe indirectly, but he's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, songs of the week: "Gone" by Charlie XCX, "Hate Me Sometimes" by Stan Atlantic. Uh, make sure to check in at the end of the month. We'll have a playlist of all of our songs, Apple Music and Spotify. And uh, that's it for this week. I think our episodes are just going to naturally be longer as of now, right? We're hitting an hour pretty regularly again, so. Maybe we just start expecting that. I don't know. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Well, there, it's not, you know, the first 50 episodes were us chatting. This is more where we have things we're trying to cover and discuss. Yeah. So maybe yeah. it's a good thing. Let us know. Tweet at us. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I will, I got a, got a lot of work to do, so I'll talk to you probably in five minutes, but, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're coming back next week with a very exciting episode. We're going to be talking about Hoobastank, right? <laughs> I would leave the tea. Yes, it, f- yeah, we are. Leave the tease at that. Hoobastank, it's a long time coming. Or is it? Uh, who knows? But they shocked the world, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna react. We're gonna oh, go yeah. back in time. Time travel. It's another one of the fifteen year reunions from 04. So, but uh, I couldn't be more excited. <laughs> uh, but I love you, man. This was fun. I'm excited. <laughs> gonna hoop a snake man we'll we'll get there next week all right uh i'll talk to you soon love you man all right love you too dude see ya guys thank you so much for sticking all the way to the end you know we certainly appreciate it please tweet at the show at underscore reminiscent fm and let us know what you were doing the first time you heard the song i miss you by blink 182 and let us know do you think the band is dead are they in purgatory are they entertainment for the band where did the girls come from what do we do about the spiders all right we will talk to you next week love you all so much have a good week bye